Welcome to episode 106 of Let's Talk Geek, recorded on Wednesday, the 22nd of August, 2012. In the show, we interview Michuki Mwangi from the Internet Society, who is in South Africa to attend the African Peering and Interconnection Forum. We also take a look at the DigiSpark, who brings the AllSpark to the Arduino platform, but can it power giant robots? And a planetary-scale total annihilation game from Uber Games has launched on Kickstarter. Go pledge your money now. Thanks for watching. Welcome to the show. In the show today is me, Jan Vermeulen. Me, Tim Hawk. And me, Gerrit Vermeulen. We'll also be joined a little bit later by Michuki Mwangi, who works at the Internet Society. He's a development manager there, and uh, he's based in Kenya. He's down in South Africa to uh, take part in their conference and uh, about uh, inter interconnect and stuff, which... I think uh, some of the internet and networking geeks out there uh, would enjoy. So if you've got any questions in the IRC, if you're watching us live, start thinking of them now. And, uh, and when he's on, we'll... Yeah. So I won't be watching the IRC, but I'll make Tim do it. I am. <laughs> Great. And then uh, we'll fire through some questions for him uh, a bit later. He couldn't join us at the start of the show. He's there in workshops and stuff. Um, so we're going to be calling him a bit later, and hopefully that works out okay. Cool. Uh, good old Skype and Windows hopefully don't let us down. Microsoft talking to Microsoft. Yeah, that's it, still a dice roll. It should, it should, should all generally work. <laughs> I, I, having said that, we tested it early because we, do, we were doing playing for Software Freedom Day. We traced, tested Google Chat. Fail. Utter, well, not Google Chat, uh, Google Hangouts or all this no, stuff. Hang on. Utter, utter fail. It just uses way too much bandwidth for this country. I'm sure it's great overseas, but here it needed uh, the minimum of 512 kilobits per second. Yikes. Up. By bi-directional. Uh, no chance. Yeah, yeah. We have a random for the show today. Uh, if you think today's mobile patent war is bad, check out the war the Wright brothers were embroiled in from 1906 to 1918. Against? Uh, everyone. Like this was, uh, it was actually, uh, like people joked, you know, like people joke about Samsung and Apple today. They said mm -hmm. there was a company who joked and said that if somebody jumped up and down and waved their arms in the air, the Wright brothers would sue them um, for sure. patent infringement. So, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was fairly hectic. Yeah, it was fairly hectic so during that time. It keeps on repeating itself. Yeah, indeed. And so uh, to, to put that, this in perspective, it's not just anything. Um, they, they filed a patent for... Um, for those who don't know, what the Wright brothers did is they uh, – the breakthrough was that they had pitch, roll, and yaw in a single control system for the, for the aircraft control, right? And so um, they filed for a patent for that, and that got declined initially, and then they got somebody else to draw up the patent. And the patent was so general – does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. um, the, their, their initial control scheme was based on a rear rudder, a front elevator – and uh, wing deformation. Uh, so not alirons, but like uh, a, a kind of... Yeah, it would be bend the wings back. Yeah, yeah, there's, 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 a, there's a cool word for it, and I should have written it down um, so that I could tell you guys. I'm just going to open the page, and then I'll tell you. Um, and so, and that, and that was their actual initial design. But the patent was so general that they managed to sue and win the, against the inventor of the aliron. The person who invented the little flappy thingies on the wings that lets you roll... They, they won a, a patent infringement case against that guy. Um, and the Aliron is what we use today, not wing warping is what it's called. So, uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, and that ties in with 106 somehow. I'll figure that because out. Because we a bit say later. it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go events. Cool. So we only have one or two of the tonight. 106. 106 years ago. No, 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 no. Definitely not. Not quite. No. no, it was uh, 2000, uh, 1906 to 1912, 18. Mm. 1918, yeah. So I will come upon it later. Um, the, I definitely got to this. I, it's fairly random, hence <laughs> the random, but uh, I did get to this in a, in a, a legitimate way. Um, so uh, we've got a whole bunch of events to get through. So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get us started on that. Uh, first up, happening right now from today, uh, from the 22nd to the 24th of August, is the 2012 African Peering and Interconnection Forum. That's by the Internet Society. Um, that, uh, and so we'll have, um, we'll have um, Michuki in the show a bit later to tell us about that. We need to, to apologize to your brother. 
T- tell us why we need to apologize. 2012 minus 106. Really? It's 1906. Dudes. <laughs> oh, it's been a long week. That's but, definitely but well done. That well done. Um, and I'm fairly sure that's not how I got to it. I might. <laughs> I might be it's truly <laughs> randomly related. I, I might be wrong, um, but I will. <laughs> I'll just double check a bit later. But cool. uh, I'm fairly sure that's not how I got to it. So that's a wonderful coincidence. Cool. Um, all right, so uh, then we've also got coming up towards the end of August, from the 28th to the 2nd, a huge event called Amaze. Uh, and this is being hosted in Johannesburg. Um, and it's actually a German organization who are bringing their gaming event to Johannesburg, if I've got uh, the basic details of this right. Um, there, will, there will be links in the show notes, and there will be links in IRC, I'm sure, any second now. And... Um, Basically, the, the, the reason I came upon this, my gaming actually ran an article, but Indie Game the Movie is being screened in South Africa. And it's being screened tomorrow night, if you're watching the show live, that's Thursday the 23rd of August, in Cape Town. Um, at, a theor- at a theater who, will, who shall remain nameless. You, you're more than welcome to go check out the My Gaming article on the screening of Indie <laughs> Game the Movie for, for details on, where, on which theater this is in. Um, so, and then uh, it's also being screened in Johannesburg during a maze. So we're going to have our own, big, hopefully, big screen screenings of Indie Game, the movie, which you can already download if you want to. Um, but I think it's pretty cool to get our own screenings of, yes. of the movie in South Africa. Cool. We've got PyCon coming up 4th in, and 5th of October. In Cape Town. In Cape Town at the Pavilion Clock Tower. Okay. Apparently, apparently it's a really spanky place. Also oh. in Cape Town is yes. iWeek from 10th to the uh, 14th of September. Cape Town's getting all the love this time. Yeah, so um, th- that's a free conference. Just register and you can get to go. That's going to be about 10 kilometers from the Cape Town City Center. Also at a swanky conference hotel type thing. Cool. We've got Software Freedom Day coming up, Tim. I don't know if you want to say something about that. Um, on the 15th of September. Software Freedom slash Science Hack Day. Yes, uh, it's actually going to be combined with Science Hack Day. Uh, we we one th- it might move by week, but at the moment it doesn't look like it. Just there might be another event on the day. So it's looking uh, at but the we're 15th looking f- of September. Yeah, but we will. I'll, I will tell you. We're signing Tomorrow the final least. thing tomorrow okay. and next week. I'll g- guarantee the day. There, it's there. Give or take a week. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've almost finalised the venue. That's why I don't want to mention the venue. But our whole aim is to a- aim it at geeks. So what we're going to we're going to have like a keynote speaker, which mm-hmm. we it looks like we're going to get the. Uh, SKA, one of the lead Ooh. guys there to come chat to us. Uh, then after that, it's going to be lightning talks of 10 minutes, a full range of topics. Um, like I know I'm wanting to talk about possibly uh, load balancing and line bonding for ADSL lines, how to do it yourself at home. Um, there's other guys who are wanting to talk about Python. There's other guys who want to talk about beer brewing. Um, but, you know, and if you find something boring, within 10 minutes, you can have a new talk. Yeah. Um, so we are trying to gear this to get you as much geek Stuff as you can in one day. How will beer brewing fit in with software freedom? Oh, we thought it's actually about geek brewing because, you know, you get the open beer stuff where yeah. the guys have got the o- open um, recipes for beer. Okay. Um, and it's w- we, we, we're thinking it's sort of we want to aim it more like a more geeky event. And then directly as part and after it, there's the Science Hack Day, which they're trying to get a whole bunch of guys together. And this is uh, hacking in the sense of building, not, not trying to hack into servers. Um, so we want the, gu- the guys are going to try and build software and get together, and that's going to go through the rest of the Saturday and into the Sunday. Um, and they've got a couple guys there to, to, to and projects they want to work on, which is also going to be pretty cool. So I'm going to try and get. I am involved with definitely with one, and I'm going to try and be involved with the other as well. Cool. I think we'll all be there. Saffron, by the way, I just I just remembered um, independently of Saffron, uh, that's what Leibniz said. Um, that how I got to 106. It's the XKCD. XKCD 106 is about the Wright brothers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Happy coincidence. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> cool. Um, and then afterwards, Hobby X? Nope. We skipped one. Um, no, one. well, there, that's also in October. Okay. Um, so 6 to 9 uh, September is Hobby X. Um, we've also got oh. uh, Rage coming up, which uh, we haven't got on the list, but uh, that's, and we've they, spoken they, about that a lot previously. <coughs> we all saw speaking about it again. I know we're going to try and record there again this year. Yeah, yeah. Um, then we've got the My Broadband Conference uh, awesome. coming up on the 10th of October at Vodacom World in Midrand. Registrations are open. Also a free event. 
but you can't come if you don't register. Yes, I'm um, signed up already. Great. Yep, already done. Cool bananas. I, I don't have to register. <laughs> I have the inside track. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, never mind, you don't have to register. You have to be there. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of um, have to be we there. are going to be streaming it as well uh, with Mindset are going to do the recording and we're going to be streaming live or on uh, Altinet.tv. So if you can't make it, we'd prefer you there. It's a way better in, in, in real life. So look, if you can get there, get there. Mm. But if you can't and you're stuck in Cape Town, ha, 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 uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can watch it live across the stream. Yeah, and there's going to be more than enough space. Um, we have the, uh, the full Vodacom world. The dome. Yeah, the, we, we, the dome and spillover into the other ones, if, if I understood the registration correctly. Bonus. Mm. And uh, then we've got ZACon coming up um, on the 27th of October. We'll probably talk about that a bit uh, in, in more a depth. Closer. And hopefully we can even get Dominic on. That would yeah, be great. We'll, we'll try to get him on again. I'll, I'll chat him and email him. Maybe also, I, th- I would imagine go. they still got looking for papers. I know that generally there are. So if, you, if you've got a security-related and real hacking of computers this time related paper, uh, I would definitely go and recommend trying to get there and trying to do. They're trying to do pr- pretty much the black hat and white hat things that are happening overseas. Mm. Trying mm. to replicate that in this country. Yeah. 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 Then we've got House for Hack. Um, that Just this weekend. Yeah. Uh, they have an introduction to Ruby uh, event. Uh, no, workshop. There we go. Uh, which is exactly what it says. Introduction to Ruby, the programming language. Uh, 300 rands, voltain dollars, rand. Uh, and that includes lunch, and they have snacks and coffee and whatnot. It's good fun. Uh, at least Ruby, the little bit that I've worked in it, is good fun. But it's always good fun to be at House for Hack. Yeah. Um, meet some really cool people and spend the day. It's really a great place learning. to do some geekery. I, mm. I mean, like, I can't think of a cooler place to do geekery than, than here. So, you know, it's been, it's really cool. Um, and uh, once again, we've mentioned this in previous shows, but um, we've got a group of folks who are going to start up a South African Disc World convention. And in the lead up to this convention, they're going to be hosting an event on the 24th of November in Cape Town. <laughs> so if you're in Cape Town, <laughs> there's tons, tons happening. There's good stuff for you happening. Which is why we had to rub in the My Ball Bank conference. Yeah, we'll, we'll just geek out in Cape Town. Yeah, so we'll just do our own thing up here. At least we've got ZACon too. We've got ZACon, we've got Software Freedom Day, and, and we My Broadband Ball Conference. Cool. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, into uh, the show topics. Into the show topics. Um, I don't know if you guys feel like discussing uh, My Broadband Conference uh, a lot more. I mean, the, the arrangements are still, it's still fairly early days. There's, there, there, I mean, the confirmed speakers and stuff are, are up on the site. Mm, saw uh, some, some heavy hitters there. Yes, um, always are. Lots of CEOs, a couple of ex-CEOs. I don't know if you got Lars again. No, no. Uh, this year we have Alan Ott Craig. That works. At Vodacom. At Vodacom. <laughs> uh, this is going to go down so well. So it's going to go quite well. I see you also have Ani... Uh, Aki. Aki. Yeah. Doing uh, our, uh, as I said, I was like wrong. Aki and Sasha, who is always very good. Um, yeah, he's a blast. Yes. He's a blast to have. Yeah. So it promises to be great. Um, and, uh, and with that, I think uh, let's see if um, we can get our guest on the line. Um, until, until we've got our guest on the we'll line, start though. start talking about... Uh, yeah, Tim, you spotted an amazing Kickstarter project. I put my money on immediately yeah, me, when you lead me to it. Uh, so I it's called actually haven't. Planetary Annihilation. Tell me about this. Yes. What is it, Tim? Uh, basically, it's a uh, strategy game. Mm-hmm. And the idea is eventually to annihilate planets. Okay. So pretty much in this, uh, it's some guys, that I, I can't remember the other things that they've done. But they've done a preview one. And basically what they're trying to do is sort of do... Um, strategy games but on large scale okay uh, we can have lots of guys going to also where you eventually you start blasting off your planet and then you take colonize moons and stuff like that and you turn them into ballistic weapons you turn asteroids. moons asteroids and asteroids oh, it's, it's both into yeah, ballistic yeah. weapons that you then <laughs> circle around to take out your opposing team's <laughs> fortresses and stuff hence planetary annihilation it's like total annihilation and supreme commander but you know, Supreme Commander was like, we're taking Total Annihilation to the next level. You know, you can have this mass- massive com- command interface thing and it's dual screen optimized. So you've got like the hectic overview uh, window and you've got the down and dirty view um, and, and, and all that stuff. And this is going to go a level even above that. So now you're um, not just going to fight on one planet, you're going to fight on multiple planets. And 
Chick, chick, look, and you, if you get to do with a bugs did in what was that movie? <coughs> Starship Troopers. There we go with flinging yes. asteroids at people. Um, just go check out the video. It is just awesome. Yeah. I've also signed up for it. It was like, I'm not sure that that's in-game graphics. Looking no, no, at, no. It, it's designed. But generally, if they've designed that, it, it might. I'm hoping if they can get anywhere near that video, yeah, it, it's it, worth it. It looked, it looked, you know, like a realistic target. The, yeah. the, it, the models were not, you know, chiseled and highly textured and everything. It was, you know, it seemed like, you know, normal blocky command and conquer style 3D graphics with, you know, uh, modest texturing and stuff. It looked like my PC could handle yeah, it. Have, no, have they said what sort of engine they're using? It'd probably be their own. Um, uh, what, what's the name of the studio involved? Um, uh, I'll, I will get that for you. But the guys involved, I mean, obviously are the guys who, who worked on Total Annihilation. Okay. Um, or at yeah. least some of the guys who worked on Total Annihilation. Um, oh, and interesting, um, they were going to uh, run on Windows and OS X. They now have confirmed a Linux version. Hmm. Of the game. So I'm getting total annihilation for Linux. This is going to be great. Yeah. It's Uber Entertainment, uh, which Uber. is uh, founded in 2008. Uh, industry vet- veterans. Um, uh, yeah, I'm um, trying to see. But I know the, the old guys that we were with, Total Annihilation, Morrowind, um, uh, Command and Conquer Generals. The, the the games that they've released, for those of you who aren't like plugged into uh, gaming news, they've done Monday Night Combat. Um, and in 2011, they brought m- uh, Monday Night Combat to Steam and Super Monday Night Combat, which they continue to update weekly, they say. So they've worked on, ga- on games like Total Annihilation, Command and Conquer, Supreme Commander, and Demigod. So, but a fairly well credentialed team. Cool. Well, we think we're getting our guests in now. Yep. Sounds good. Hello. Hi there. Hello. How's Hi. it going? Can you hear us? Can you see me? Yes, yep. we can yes, see you. Yes, I can hear you. Good. <coughs> all this, all, by movie magic, will be edited out, I hope. Yes. <laughs> They're at the point where Tim says we're getting our guest in now. And then cut. <laughs> well, and I'm going to cut when we finish to become the last topic and then bring, bring this in. Okay, cool. All right. Do you want to just bring him in? Sure, sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm happy to be here. Cool. Um, uh, with us today, we've got uh, Michuki Mwangi. Am I saying that correct? Correctly? Yes, oh, definitely you are. <laughs> Great. It's like uh, you've been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> I have been practicing. Um, Michuki uh, is from the Internet Society, and he's in South Africa. Uh, he's, he's based in Kenya, but he's in South Africa for a conference. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the African uh, Internet, uh, Interconnect uh, is a policy conference, uh, Michuki. Well, it's actually both policy and technical. Okay, great. Um, so yes. thank you very much for joining us and for giving of, our, uh, giving of your time. Uh, I know you're very busy uh, and I had to dash off uh, when we, just, just before we started the show uh, to go into a workshop and uh, really appreciate you taking time out of your workshop to, to join us for the interview. Um, um, I'm definitely happy to be here. Uh, Michuki, um, uh, give us a brief introduction of the Internet Society. What do you do and why do you do it? Uh, well, the Internet Society is an organization that was established in 1992 uh, by the fa- founders of the Internet, uh, one of them being uh, Vint Saf. And and uh, the reasoning behind it was that they wanted an organization that can actually um, be behind uh, or one of the drivers of the future of the internet in that uh, overseeing what the internet will look like, making sure that some of the principles uh, that help make the internet what it is today uh, are still upheld uh, going forth because at that point in time the internet was emerging as something that will be you know at uh, I'll say pulling points uh, with businesses trying to get involved in the internet with uh, you know um, governments wanting to get involved and so on and so forth so they needed to be a neutral organization that would make sure that those principles that help make the internet what it is today uh, are still upheld and maintained uh, so that we continue to benefit from this resource. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what uh, what, uh, principles uh, are those broadly? 
Well, the the principles uh, of the internet are uh, such as openness. You know, the internet needs to remain an open, collaborative platform that uh, people can actually come onto without feeling restricted or closed or blocked off because there is no interoperation between different networks or different platforms or different systems. And uh, that's one of the key principles that, you know, if it remains open, a collaborative uh, uh, supports a collaborative uh, framework, then it makes it possible uh, such that we can uh, accommodate more people who come on board. We can be able to spur innovation as we go forth. Um, So those are fundamental things that need to be protected when it comes to the internet, uh, not just now, but in the future. All right. Um, yeah, absolutely, uh, and I, I definitely agree. Uh, your, um, uh, what's your what's your role at the Internet Society, and and what are you in South Africa for? Uh, my role at the Internet Society is um, I'm the Regional Development Manager f- uh, for Africa, and uh, what we do here in Africa is uh, mostly to uh, do regional development and by regional development I know it sounds very um, uh, sort of um, NGO or um, ICT for development but we're actually looking at the critical uh, part of the infrastructure. What makes the internet work in Africa? And is it there? And is it working well? And if it's not working well, then how can we fix it? And in this particular case, it leads us to what is going on here in South Africa. Uh, We have uh, this um, issue of interconnection and traffic exchange. Now, let me give an example here. a lot of you know that you know South Africa is well known for its wine, and um, you know uh, if you if you're in South Africa like me, you'll have the benefit of enjoying perfectly beautiful wine at very low cost because you know it's made in South Africa. Um, but if I have to buy the same bottle of wine in Europe or in the US, it will cost me three five times more that. Yeah. So that's pretty expensive. But hey, it is what it is. Well. If you reverse that on the internet, a lot of the content we actually access um, comes from uh, from when we're in Africa is either hosted in Europe or in the US. So we tend to pay a lot more for it. Um, So what do we need to do to fix this? Um, Well, we need to make sure that we're in a position to trade. Either we have something to trade with the West so that our costs come down or uh, we're in a position to generate enough traffic here that we actually don't have to depend on traffic that's actually hosted abroad. So there's two ways to it. And this is the kind of discussion we need to create in Africa so that we can fix what we call a a current deficit on our internet uh, internet traffic. Currently, Ninety percent of the traffic, um, actually, statistics show almost ninety-eight, ninety-nine percent of the traffic consumed in Africa is actually imported from abroad, and we only generate around about one, slightly about uh, about one, less than two percent. Mm, mm. yeah. Is is that a is that a content issue though? Um, stuff not being hosted on the continent, um, uh, or or is that uh, is that purely an interconnect issue? Well, it it it's 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 twofold. Um, one, uh, the, definitely, there is a content issue, but the content issue is the fact that actually the services are not there. Um, if you look at the amount of content that's been generated and hosted abroad, it makes for a very small percentage. Um, a lot of the services are not online. If you look at government services, there are very few government services that are online. In fact, many African countries don't have government services online. The few that have websites, they've hosted the websites abroad, but they are not websites with a lot of traffic. You know, it's just a website saying, you know, this is the government office and click here to, you know, read the speech of the uh, whoever is sitting in that government ministry and so on. So nothing that will take you there day in, day out. So when the services do go online, then we can talk about content. Right now, it's just a place of 
information storage and not really something that drives traffic. Um, the other side to it is that we have a lot of communication that happens. Remember, uh, one of the fundamental things that drives uh, traffic is business. If you look at economics uh, the studies that have come up from various quarters, be it the World Bank, be it uh, the, um, the many uh, the regional uh, org- economic organizations, they are saying that intra-Africa business trade is growing. That means that there is a lot of traffic that is equally generated because there is no way you can be doing business with intra-Africa without communication. But the question is, how does this traffic between intra-African countries go? Right now, it goes through Europe. So we don't know where it is. We can't see it. Now, let me give an example. In today's workshop, somebody said they put up a test between uh, Nairobi and Johannesburg. They put up a link. It was an STM1, which was about 100 and um, an STM1 capacity, so 155 megabits. Now, they wanted to just put it on test to see is there traffic. So they switched it on in the evening at around 8 p.m. And the following day, by around 10 p.m., they had to switch off the link. Why? It was saturated. So the moment people came to work in the morning, they saturated 155 megabits between Johannesburg and Nairobi. That means there's been more traffic between Johannesburg and Nairobi than people actually knew it existed. Mm. Now, why is there no direct interconnection between Johannesburg and Nairobi? Well, according to the speaker, they said that the cost of actually buying capacity from Johannesburg to Nairobi is more expensive than buying Johannesburg to London and mm-hmm. the same thing from Johannesburg to Nairobi. So all operators feel, well, for $10 <coughs> a meg more, let's just meet in London. It's yeah. cheaper. And that's what is happening with the interconnection. Mm. And now that's a, that's a, a big problem, not just across the continent, but inside individual countries as well, as I understand it. The cost of just transporting traffic from one end of the country, uh, South Africa is an example, to the other end of the country, um, the, the reports we get is that it, it's exactly that. It's actually more expensive to move the traffic locally than it is to just go via London. Um, how do we solve that problem? You you absolutely uh, right with that. That indeed, and um, you know, South Africa is not the only uh, country suffering with this. Uh, we've had cases of Nigeria as well, um, and and many others. Um, two things have to happen. One, um, in terms of competition. You must have competition in country when it comes to terrestrial infrastructure. Look, if you only have one operator that pulls cable between Cape Town and and uh, and, and Johannesburg, um, you know it's it's going to be monopoly. So you pay uh, the price that you get. If you have ten people with the same infrastructure, you know, and they are using different business models, the price is definitely going to go down. The government also, uh, from that standpoint, has to put those frameworks and those policies in place to make sure that there is a healthy, thriving, competitive environment in that particular country for it to happen. Now, you may wonder, is this really possible? And I'll tell you, yes, it is. Uh, Let's compare East Africa, uh, my home country in Kenya. We certainly do have slightly cheaper prices than South Africa when it comes to terrestrial infrastructure. Reason being that, you know, we have multiple players across the country. And there is a regulator that has tried, worked very hard to make sure that, you know, there's some sense of competition um, that, that's going on and as a result the prices may not be you know super cheap but you know they're significantly lower than in other countries at least at at least much lower than Nigeria and South Africa definitely Um, uh, while uh, while we we have some time I'd like to to get into some questions that we've received from our listeners Um, so the, the first one is, uh, what is the best technology to use in rural Africa? And, and perhaps uh, a way to, to think of that uh, or, or to, to also address that question is, uh, what have you seen uh, technology-wise be very successful in Africa to bring internet uh, to people in, in rural Africa? Well, uh, and that's, that's a very good question. 
uh, question asked and, um, you know, which currently I think uh, doesn't have, uh, you know, a direct answer because um, the challenge is that these, well, when, when you talk about technology, technology is always evolving. So I don't think we, we have the perfect technology to say that this is the best to roll out and reach out to the underserved communities or the rural parts of, of the world. We, we don't have that solution. Uh, you know, um, over the last few years, we've had many people saying wireless is going to be, you know, the solution to all the humankind problems when it comes to access but you know we've seen why max has come it's it's well i i don't want to say it has failed but you know <coughs> it hasn't really filled uh, addressed the issue because it was expensive to roll out so i've had a lot of positive stuff with something like lte you know and there's a lot of positive stuff that's being done with lte uh, is it going to be the solution I don't know. Mm. You know, only time will tell. It it is quite difficult with technology because of the way it evolves, because of the um, you know the economics involved in developing technology to a point that it becomes cost effective to deploy it to that extent. And most importantly, I think that um, the geography of Africa in itself um, tends to. Uh, for lack of a better word, play against us. And uh, let me let me let me clarify that. Um, we we are very uh, sparsely uh, located, especially when you go to the rural areas. And so, with that kind of uh, you know dispersion uh, in those in those locations, the challenge will be: How do you come up with a technology that is cost effective to serve? 20 people in 100 square kilometers. You know, um, how do you do that? Mm. And remember, the vast majority of people in Africa actually live in those kind of environments. They are nomads, uh, by and large. So how do we address that? So there, there are much larger questions to ask. And sometimes I say, well, wireless is a very good um, bridge to actually try and get people some sense of con connectivity, we we may not be talking uh, to say that that's the finality. We 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 still are here to come up with some technology that will actually address this uh, to a level that uh, you know everybody will feel that it's actually uh, satisfactory. Mm. So. I, for me, it's a wait and see. Why Max really had my hopes up, but you know, um, right now I'm I'm not the first person to say, "Hey, it's Why Max." So, and I'm not going to be the first one to say LTE. Um, I, I think I'll, uh, I've learned my lesson, and I'll wait and see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, now, now, uh, Why Max and LTE are technologies that that rolled out in in regulated bands. What about um, because we have some listeners that are avid. Uh, a network a wireless networking amateurs uh, using unregulated bands. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you know yes. Wi-Fi type technologies. Um, uh, how yes. okay, could that be used? Could that be you know to to effectively connect uh, rural Africa? <coughs> Well, um, again, they, they they will fall under the same problems uh, um, uh, which wireless spectrum tends to fall in. One, um, I, I know there's the whole discussion about the white spaces. Um, uh, I, I've seen a lot of discussion. Uh, one thing we need, really need to be clear and people need to appreciate is the fact that, you know, the wireless spectrum is not an infinite spectrum. It, it, it is finite. And for that reason, um, we need to, to, to make some clear calls and know what is it that we actually want to accomplish. You know, do we want to provide a sense of connectivity or are we actually looking to provide proper connectivity? So, uh, and that, to me, that's where it, the line comes in. What are we trying to accomplish? If it's a sense of connectivity, I mean, 3G has done way more than uh, any other technology I've seen being able to accomplish. Um, so LTE will probably step that up a little bit more, uh, but it's expensive. Um, so if we are looking at... Uh, you know, uh, some of the other spectrum like 5.8 and 2.4, I mean, that, 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 that's, that's just messy, you know, it, in terms of distances and all other technological challenges that it, it's likely to come uh, to, to face when it comes to deployment. So 
my, my bottom argument point will be what are we trying to accomplish? Are we trying to give a sense of connectivity or are we trying to provide proper broadband connectivity? So um, at that point, when we come to the discussion, then the technology we have, if we are going to say we are providing broadband connectivity, then um, I don't see anything out there yet that can deliver it in a cost-effective way. If we are looking for some sense of connectivity, then there's definitely a multiple mix and, uh, you know, um, I'll say you, there's a blend and mix that you can actually do to actually give some sense of connectivity. Mm -hmm. Another question we've got from IRC is um, whether you can give a general overview of what the internet landscape looks like, uh, as in what are home users using, uh, what the mobile adoption is like, and what small and medium enterprises are, are using uh, across the continent, or at least in the areas that you're familiar with. Well, um, in sub-Sahara Africa, um, the one thing that has come out very strongly is that the mobile has played a revolutionary role in uh, in bringing access to the mass. Um, I think right now there are very few countries in sub-Sahara Africa that you will go to that don't have access to connectivity um, through mobile uh, technology that I'm talking about 2G, 3G, and in a few countries that have actually started rolling out LTE. Uh, so to uh, looking at um, access uh, across the sub-Sahara region. I think, you know, I even do it in uh, at home in Nairobi. You know, I have a 3G dongle, as we call them in East Africa, or a 3G modem, uh, which is connects to onto USB um, that will give me 3G up to, you know, right now the competition is getting to 21 megabits per second um, um, on 3.75, as they so call it. Um so they, there's a lot of that in sub-Sahara Africa. Um, when we look at North Africa, there's um, a, 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 there's quite um, a well-developed infrastructure when it comes to DSL connectivity, uh, pretty much similar to South Africa, if not better. Uh, so... Um, it definitely, there's a, a huge gap when it comes to terrestrial infrastructure, fixed connectivity in sub-Sahara Africa, excluding South Africa, where, you know, very limited number of phone lines, um, very limited copper on the ground if it hasn't been pulled out and turned into some uh, ornaments and sold abroad. And uh, so, you know, um, so I'll say wireless has been the main driver of access in sub-Sahara Africa, at least for the last five years. Mm -hmm. and will be at least for a few more to come. Um, what we're also seeing is the growth of now. There's a lot of uh, fiber being used as backhaul. Um, and then we are seeing um, an emerging trend I've seen in a couple of countries in Mozambique. I've seen this in Kenya. I've seen this happening in Ghana where there's uh, – emergence of uh, coaxial cable and fiber to the home, fiber to the cabinet, uh, triple play services coming in, uh, which brings some sort of fixed connectivity sense into it. Uh, but by and large, majority of the middle SME business will get connectivity through um, through um, uh, wireless technology, whether it be it WiMAX or some 3G service, mm. that tends to be the, 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 the main um, technology that's leading. The, does satellite uh, play a role um, in these markets at all? Satellite connectivity? Um, satellite still does play a role. And um, uh, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, West Africa um, uh, has remained largely dependent on satellite, uh, partly due to the fact that until very recently, um, um, and you know, I, I can't actually confirm right now, but most of the cables, the, there was largely only one cable, submarine cable that touched a number of the uh, countries on the West African coast going all the way to North West Africa uh, from Senegal coming down all the way. And the 
cost on that submarine cable was significantly higher that it was actually cheaper to buy capacity on satellites uh, because of the business model, especially on the Sat3 cable. And I'm sure for most of you in South Africa, you, you, you've, you've experienced this for much longer than most of anyone else. So you know that. And um, so as a result, um, you know, I know Nigeria, for instance, by and large, um, uh, still largely dependent, inland Nigeria, still largely dependent on satellite because it's cheaper than going on to Sat3. Um, um, and terrestrial equally be more expensive. So, you know, if buying capacity from uh, um, uh, Abuja, which is inland in Nigeria, to uh, Lagos is more expensive um then you you have to play the card between satellite and going by uh, submarine. A few other countries uh, like you know uh, Gambia, uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia um, are still largely dependent on satellite because the, the wax cable just landed; it's not yet gone operational. So they're still there, and also. I believe that uh, satellite will play a big role um, in providing uh, an alternative backup uh, for critical services, you know, banking and so on. They will largely depend on something that's uh, that will be there regardless of, you know, cable cuts or the similar outages. Um, so... I still see there is a role to play. Uh, there are some places which won't be covered by fiber uh, for a long time to come, at least maybe in the next five to ten years. So there will be a role to play for fiber, I mean for satellite. And, um, uh, you know, uh, as technology evolves, the costs come down, we will see alternatives to it. Uh, but I still feel that we'll still see satellite for a long time to come. Mm -hmm. uh, Mitsugi, uh, um uh, I believe that's brought us to the end of, of uh, the time we have with you. Uh, the, I was briefed and told that, uh, that you only had 20 minutes. Um, and so I don't want to keep yes. you from what you, what you need to do uh, while you're here in South Africa. Thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, and for giving the time that you were able to give. And uh, hopefully we'll get to well, chat to you again soon. It's been my soon. pleasure. Cool. Yeah. Nice to see the guys from yeah. really Thank enjoyed you very it. much. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. You've really yeah. sparked discussion. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks a lot. Have a nice evening. You too. Right. You too. <clears throat> cool. Sorry, I, there were a lot of questions um, still that, that uh, we could unfortunately not ask uh, because of the limited time. Thank everybody who, who joined us uh, in IRC uh, and, and pelted through questions. And, um, and maybe um, it's worth, worthwhile reading out some of the questions um, uh, just, just to give an idea of, of, of the types of of questions that, that are raised, um, you know, with with the internet in South Africa. So, um, the the one that I that I see in front of me is um, what has happened with the reliability of connections in sub-Saharan Africa. We saw a drop when uncapped ADSL was introduced. Is the rest of Africa seeing the same growth pains? And wasn't that um, a, a lot of that uncapped ADSL was introduced when CECOM landed? Mm. CECOM was still busy, kind of teething. I mean, it, it was fairly new. Um, we'd only just started using it. So, I mean, since then, it's gotten a lot more stable. And, and I think there, there, there needs to be a, a, a clear definition here because I think uh, perhaps, I don't want to put words in the, in, the, in the questioner's mouth, but there's, there's reliability of your international uh, subsea mm -hmm. cable, CECOM, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, or SAT3 or WAX now, uh, and the myriad uh, easy, easy of uh, other cables that, that we've got down in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, we're very lucky down here, actually, compared to other African nations who have access to only one coast, let alone the ones who have access to no, no coast. coast. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's the other uh, thing where I've noticed a definite decrease in overall throughput since, um, since Uncapped was introduced. Um, now, there's no way for me to say that this is so because it's only been in my experience and, and in the places that I've lived and in the places that I've worked. Uh, I can't speak for anywhere else in the country. I can only, you know, say what I've seen in reports. Mm. And we're seeing congested, ex congested exchanges mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, I, the kind of problems I, that we didn't have when, uh, when there was no uncapped internet. Yeah, but the only way you, you fix those problems is by having uncapped internet and pushing those exchanges to prove that they're under uh, developed. And, and what we see is actually happening is a lot of these exchanges are slow, slowly but are starting to be upgraded, mm. which is allowing more and more speed. And the only way you, you get that to happen is to saturate the exchange and force them to go, 
well, this isn't working for me. Mm, mm. And if there's a business case, the exchange will obviously be yeah. upgraded. However, we are sitting in a bit of a, a transition period because Telcom is busy working on a long-term, well, in my, in, my, in my view, a long-term plan, but it's actually in business terms, a medium-term plan mm. to replace exchanges with MSANs, mm. multi-service access nodes. <clears throat> Which and will give us speeds of what around forty megabits. It, it'll it'll enable DSL speeds of uh, VDSL speeds of forty megabits 40 per megabit. second, but and fiber eventually if you can pull fiber from the MSAN to. I, I have a question with that. Yeah, where does MSANs terminate? Uh, what do you mean terminate? Well, you've got the MSAN, which then goes back. It goes and, and from there it feeds into the telecom core network. Oh, it is good directly into core. I thought uh, it went back to the exchange. No, the, they completely short out the exchange. Okay, all right. Um, that's based on questions that we asked them when they took us for a bit of a tour in Waterkloof to take a look at where okay, they're no, rolling out the yeah. MSANs. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so the whole idea is that the MSAN will shorten the local loop um, for, and for those of you on copper ADSL, well, I say for those of you, all of us, uh, I mean, the majority of us in, in the more developed parts of South Africa, DSL is your go-to home connection. Mm. I mean, if you can, if you can have it, you, you do have it kind of thing um, because it's, you know, the only way to get sort of affordable, semi-affordable, uncapped, you know, decently speed, reliable speed. Well, just, just as an example, I've got a friend who's starting to do business overseas. So he's now starting to use Skype and he suddenly realized you, you need ADSL because you need that, that, constant bitrate you know uh 3g and stuff works great until you need that quality yeah yeah it's a bit bursty yes. <laughs> as you'll notice very quickly when you're trying to upload download files or do any kind of streaming um yeah so very interesting questions um i think that have been raised since south africa got to see got to taste uncapped internet like what level of service degradation are you willing to stomach and still pay for in order to not pay per gig or per meg. Um, and that's a valid question, and that's a balance that people elsewhere in the world have had to, have had to make, well, look, that, we, that we've only recently, I think since 2010, yeah. uh, have, have had the, the, the privilege to try and deal with. Generally, the pattern you see overseas is also whenever, because I think uh, in England when they initially went uncapped and all the rest of it, they also had a lot of teething problems. And bit by bit, those problems got resolved, and the speech just started increasing and increasing, which we see, we're getting the 10 megs now, we're getting... Hopefully later on 42. Mm. And we, but that's all happening because of uncapped and people actually suddenly going, well, I've got bandwidth, let me use it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And uh, hopefully then that, that's not too late for South Africa to get on, you know, hopefully there's, there's still a lot of legs in the internet bandwagon, the internet gravy train, the pick a, insert your favorite cliche for making a ton of money here. Um, because, I mean, the internet is getting to be a fairly well-populated, well-saturated place as far as services go. Um, well, I'm hoping hopefully we'll we still be able to compete. Local services. Exactly. Because it's, it's, it's sparse. It's yeah. But I mean, like, for example, if you look at, okay, uh, Kickstarter looks great. Let's make Kickstarter for Africa or for South Africa. That's not really something that can work. Facebook for South Africa. How, how do you fundamentally make that local? So you've got to... Uh, I mean, it has to be something that is so amazingly locally relevant that, um, or something that just nobody else has thought of that will be globally relevant. Yeah. And hopefully there's still room for that by the time we're able to compete on a, at least semi-equal footing, um, you know, with the rest of the world in terms of speed and stuff. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so too. All right, so um, other topics <coughs> that we found interesting is uh, last week you mentioned it, Tim, or was it you? Yeah, it was me. I think, uh, well, I got the, me yeah, the like email just after the, the show. Yeah. Breaking news, everybody. Humble Bundle 3 for Android has been released. Yeah, and it's available, and they actually just announced something cool. But first, the games that they have up, uh, Field Runners, which is pretty interesting, um, Bit Trip Beat, I think, which is debuting, or, or not, not debuting, but it's the um, first time it's on Android. Um, so maybe that is debuting. Debuting on Android, yeah. Yeah, debuting on Android. Um, played it on PC. It's actually kind of interesting. Mm. Um, Space Cam, also, I think, debuting on Android. Uplink, which, I mean, come on, it's Uplink. It's so cool. And Spirits. Uh, so five games. I think if you pay something like upwards of $6 now for those, for, for those you'll get all five games, plus soundtracks for all of them. And they actually just announced uh, on Twitter, um, so it's been updated on, on their page as well, that they've added four more games uh, to the bundle. So you can now effectively get nine games. So they've added uh, Anomaly, Edge, Osmos, and World of Goo. And if you already have those, just give them to somebody. Yeah, sure, why not? 
Um, it's Humble Bundle. It's DRM free. Uh, they're going to be adding Steam codes for those games as well. Um, so if you already have them, then maybe just share a Steam code. Um, you mentioned earlier that you can't that that it's one Steam code that you plug in uh, and to you, Steam, and, and you so don't get giftable copies. And you don't get giftable copies. Yeah, if you already um, own the game on yeah, Steam, well, <coughs> which is a pity. Uh, but you you can always download the standalone pack and you know give that to someone or, or just give them your unique link and say have at it, go download the stuff. Mm, mm. And of course, for all of those things, you get the soundtrack, and some of them have really really cool soundtracks. Uh, and that's in Flack. So lossless or, or MP3. well, some of them, some of yep. them are in flax. Some of them are in flax. Some of them are in high quality MP3. Yeah, yeah. And you've already alluded to it, but just because it's called the Humble Bundle Three for Android, doesn't all of these games, yeah, don't they don't just run on Android? They don't just run on Android. No, they're on Windows, they're on Mac, they're on Linux as well. Yeah. And so and for the Linux guys, um, they added it in the previous bundle. Uh, all of the games now plug into the software center. Yeah, Ubuntu software center. Yeah, into the Ubuntu software center. Yeah. So you can just click on the link and then it launches the software center and go download and it yeah. launch. And, and don't assume that because a game is available on PC, on Windows and Mac, I should say, um, if that it's it's also available on Windows and Mac on Steam. That's not necessarily the case. So mm. the Humble Bundle gives you your game, if you're a Mac user, uh, on Mac that where it might not be available on Steam. I've actually had a couple of examples of that. Yeah. Okay. Where it's not uh, Steam Play or whatever Steam calls it. They mm. don't have a Mac version of the game yet. So plus you get to get in get to get in early with Steam support for Linux. You already have these games uh, in your Steam library. Mm. Uh, and, and hopefully they they come to Linux as well <coughs> quite quite quickly. Yeah. And and then of course the money isn't all for just the developers. Uh, you can pick where the money goes. Uh, so you can split it between the developers or the Humble Bundle guys or some charities. I think they have Child's Play. Child Play. Child's Play, yeah, Child's the Play Penny Arcade tra Charity. Yeah, and the EFF, yeah. which is, uh, yeah, well, electronic. They're, 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 not, they're not, I mean, as South Africans, they're not local, but they still do good work. They're, what the EFF does is globally relevant. Yes. So, um, it's uh, worth supporting them. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, were, they were the guys who, who helped stand up against the likes of Sopa, Acta, um, uh, and the like. And so uh, I think most people who love a free internet were opposed to mm. Sopa and Acta. No, um, I'm, I'm happy to give some money to those folks. Yeah, yeah. Keep doing good work. Um, Tim, you found something interesting, which is a project to turn classical uh, scores, are we talking Mozart, Bach, into copyright-free music? Yeah. Um, pretty much uh, most of the, 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 this music that they're talking about here, the actual scores and actual, you know, being able to play the music is already out of copyright. But the problem is every time you actually a uh, orchestra performs it and it gets recorded, they get that copyright. copyright of that performance is from then onwards. Yeah, it's called it, uh, or if it's on a CD, it's uh, in South Africa. There's definitely a distinction made between the music, the lyrics, and the recording, the actual recording of those music and lyrics being performed, whether yeah. that's in a studio or live. Mm. Um, okay. So there was a Kickstarter about two years ago where they raised uh, $13,000 and basically to hire a full orchestra to record royalty-free classical music. Um, they've now finished it and it's all available online. So if you enjoy your classical music, uh, you can either go to um, the Muse open site or archive.org um, and they have all that music available there for free for you to download with a real orchestra that's played it. Very nice. Very cool. I, I haven't actually checked the link, but I'm hoping it's at least in high quality. Uh, I think it is. Um, format. Um, hopefully, some. Hopefully, lossless. I'm kind of holding thumbs here. Otherwise, at least high quality MP3s, if, please. If, if you keep on talking long enough, I can, I can tell you. <laughs> um, and audio files will, of course, shoot me that I'm saying high quality MP3s. They'd so much prefer AAC. Yeah, or oh, AAC. Yeah. Yeah, of, of MP3. I mean, if you can't give me flack. Uh, well, they give you two download options. One is an MP3 file, and the other one is a high quality file. Uh, and whatever high quality means. I hope if I don't kill our bandwidth, <laughs> switch to the other network. So um, I'm M4A. Oh, uh, so that's so AAC. AAC. Okay, cool. Well, we assume AAC. AAC is the go-to yeah. audio format to stick in the MPEG-4 container. Yeah. So, all right, interesting. <coughs> Interesting yeah. stuff. Really cool. um, then uh, an another interesting thing to come out, I, I the think, old this spark. week is <laughs> no the Digi Spark, <laughs> which is Arduino's little baby brother. Yeah, it's it looks quite cute. It looks it's it's, it's something like that that looks like a that looks like a teeny tiny USB flash drive. Yeah. At least the inside of a teeny tiny USB flash drive. Yeah, it does. And it's meant to be Arduino's baby brother. It's got some I.O. on there. It's got some memory on there. I don't know if one of you have the specs open. Uh, yeah, it has six I.O. pins, uh, 8K memory, and a full USB connection. 
Uh, and the aim is to try and get this out for about $12 a piece, which is <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, and it's supposed to be um, Arduino compatible, I think. So you yes. can... You can Mounted on the Arduino <coughs> somehow. Or, or, yeah, it's, so it, kind of like the shields. Yeah. Um, like Arduino shields. Um, but $12. Well, well, when, they, is, when they say Arduino nice. compatible, it's basically they've taken the schematics of the Arduino. So it's feature compatible with Arduino. The software that works with the Arduino work, will work on this. Okay. okay. This is actually so not done by the original Italian company yeah. that did Arduino. Uh, so that when I say, that when they say compatible, that's what they mean is more okay. that it's. So that you can use all the development tools yes. for the original. Uh, well, for the Arduino and their various yeah. uh, controllers, and then just plug it into this. Okay. Um, and they're trying to get this really cheap and really small. And this is also on Kickstarter. Eight more days. Eight, on Kickstarter eight, for eight more days. 18 more days, guys. 18. Okay. One eight. They have made their Kickstarter a target. They were aiming for five thousand dollars. They've already made over a hundred thousand dollars. One hundred forty-nine thousand dollars. There we go. Hundred and almost one hundred fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> These guys are going strong. Uh, I didn't realize there was that big a community for uh, this type of hacking, but that's really awesome. Yeah, it's good to see. Uh, we should totally get, uh, I don't know if the House for Hack guys are in on this, but uh, we should totally get them in on this because they love uh, working uh, with uh, Arduino. I'm sure they're going to get some of these. What's nice with this also is because it's so much smaller, um, you can fit it in your projects a lot easier. Mm. So now when this is like maybe projects you're going to want to sell, mm. uh, it, it t the, the surface area that you n now need for this thing to take it is significantly smaller. Yeah, and, and with an Arduino, um, usually with the types of hacks, you know, if, if you're just trying to do something small, you're wasting a lot of pins. Um, you know, you don't need that big thing with bunches and bunches of stuff plugged on it. Um, so this will kind of fill that gap. Yeah, that's very cool. At a very, there's so many cool things price. coming out. There's, there's this stuff, the, there's, uh, the Raspberry Pis have come out. Yeah, and people are hacking away on those things. I've seen uh, some really fun stuff with that. Um, I, I saw this, so they were doing the audio bypass to basically play the full quality audio through HDMI and yeah. uh, full quality video. Yeah. So the big problem was apparently the decoding of the audio because the process is a bit flat, but if you can mm. just do straight pass through, uh, it actually then takes it all away and you can, oh, wow. it's apparently a great, great media player. I still need, I, I haven't had time to turn one on again. Totally going to strap one of those to my TV. Yep. <laughs> that brings us then to our kickers. We have uh, two, two kickers. Yep. The first one is awesome. And Playing the stuff on stuffy drives. And the second one is awesomer. So um, there's, uh, there, there are a few guys who do, you know, playing music on stiffy drives or floppy drives, as they're called in Yankee stand. Um, <laughs> and this guy uses eight, and he plays the Ghostbusters theme. So this is the same guy that plays pretty much every other theme. Um, so, so the He's, same guy who played the Game of Thrones theme. He did the Game of Thrones theme. Okay. He does the Superman theme, which actually also sounds pretty good. Um, so check out his whole YouTube page. This it, guy does, he does fantastic and he does, stuff and with he does antiquated like, technology. Um, uh, the Aladdin uh, Arabian <laughs> Nights. Arabian Nights. He did uh, Lion King, uh, Be Prepared. So yeah, this, cool. this, this guy is, uh, is definitely a, a geek's geek. Um, the things you can do with stuffy drives. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> then, you will not believe this, even cooler than that is Kuratas. It is... What? It is it's technically a work of art <coughs> right, made by a, a, a blacksmith, but a uh, blacksmith turned artist, um, except it's supposed, it's supposed to be a fully working mech. Awesome. And it, and it costs a million dollars. This is Japan. Damn. Yep. This is, this is from Surabashi Heavy Industries in Japan. And he is slowly but surely making my, my Gundam and other mech warrior dreams come true. Um, Can they fly it? No, it, it's also not a walker. <laughs> so, the, the, I mean, our first reaction was, is this really real? I mean, is, is this actually a working mech? And what gives it an air of possibility to me is the fact that it's not a walker, that it's on wheels. Because walking robots are hard to build. Mm. Um, and they, they're hard to keep upright um, and to actually walk. Is that on three wheels? Uh, Four wheels. Four yeah, wheels. Uh, two at the back. Okay. So, it, so that's a T1. For those, for those, uh, yeah, it's the beginnings of a T1, except the T1 was on treads, I think. <laughs> yeah. So that's the other well, thing. Well, they'll it's just on, replace, if it's on four wheels, you replace that with treads. Yeah, exactly. And then we're all doomed. And then we're all well, doomed. No, no, it's hell to our rebel <laughs> overlords. <laughs> it's, so <laughs> it's, it's a pilotless head, but then um, sort of like the Matrix robot. The guy says this is less like Gundam because anybody can use it. 
um, and more like 80 Volsum or something. It's some esoteric anime I've never seen in my life. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, hang on, mech anime I haven't seen? <laughs> I must get this immediately. Um, and so a robot that anybody can pilot. So it, it looks sort of like a cross between the robots in Real Steel, if anybody's seen that movie with uh, Hugh Jackman in it, uh, where they've got yeah. robot boxing and uh, The Matrix. So um, where you sit in the main body of the, of the actual robot. Oh, maybe even uh, Mass Effect. Uh, you also get to climb in a mech and, and, or, and do stuff uh, there. Or was it Fear 3? Fear also lets you do that, yeah. Mm. So, but those, were all, those are all walkers. This one drives. It's awesome. It has guns that don't really shoot bullets. It's like Yet. mini guns that don't shoot bullets Yet. and like things that look like rocket launchers that don't shoot actual explosives. It's very sad. But, uh, but all in all, it's an awesome robot. <coughs> if I had a million dollars, I would totally spend it on this. <laughs> and several other things. <laughs> I would probably not spend it on this. I'd probably like... Come on, own personal fiber network. I'd probably set myself up for life first and then, then. <laughs> I'd spend it on this. <laughs> yeah, no, so anyway. And just with this, you have to read uh, the XKCD, uh, what would happen with if there was a robot apocalypse at the moment. Um, it's well worth... Uh, so it will decrease your fear level about robotic mm. apocalypse. Well, at least for now, for the yes. next five to ten years. Uh, okay. Five to ten years is scientific speak for I have no real idea what's exactly. going on. I have Later. no idea when this is going to happen, but people are thinking about it. It will happen just now. <laughs> just now. <laughs> Fifteen minutes. Yeah. With that, uh, I'd like to thank our guest once again for joining us, um, uh, Michuki Mwangi from Kenya, uh, who is with the Internet Society. Uh, who isn't in the show anymore. He's had to dash off, but thank you for joining us. Uh, and thank you to my fellow co-host thingies. Hail to the geeks. Gareth, <laughs> uh, where can people find you? About.me slash hockey ZA. That points you to wherever. Well, to, to everywhere where I am on the internet. Tim, where can people find you? Uh, about the only place at the moment now is Let's Talk Network. Um, you can go like the Facebook pages and etc. Cool. Facebook cool. pages, Google Plus pages. The plugging is going to happen. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm just I'll checking. Leave it up to him. He's just making sure. Plugging's like, uh, going to happen. Okay. I'm okay. on mybroadband.co.za. I write there and stuff. He's the uh, staff writer. And spend most of my time there. But when I'm not uh, nose to the keyboard, I'm at Jan VZA on Twitter or Jan Vermeulen, Circle the Ugly One, on Google+. Um, and you can find me on Facebook, but that would be rather useless since I've got uh, – I actually showed the people in the office and they were uh, – and, and I got all kinds of derogatory remarks <laughs> at me. Um, <coughs> the amount of friend requests I've got in Facebook, yeah. uh, I'm actually testing the limits, <laughs> I think, of unconfirmed does friend it, requests Does it on exceed Facebook. your inbox? Uh, I don't even know what the inbox size is. No, no, I, I mean it's, your, it's your, your, actual, your it, Gmail inbox. It scrolls now. I have no idea. Your unread messages because I've seen that and that's horrifying. <laughs> yep. And so um, for those of you who missed the, the link, um, internetsociety.org is where you can find our guest stuff. Um, if you're watching this live, then you can check out the um, AFPIF event. There's a live stream um, and the link will be in the show notes and it's going to get pasted into RC any second now if it hasn't been already. Um, and you can catch them for the next three days, uh, I think, 22, 23, and 24 August. Cool. Um, they're going to run this event talking about interconnection in, in South Africa. Um, and if uh, you're a networking or internet geek and you're remotely interested in the African continent... I, and I'm going to go and start looking at yeah, the stream. Watch, watch the stream. So um, then with that, like us, tweet us, email us. Circle at, us. Yeah, circle us. Uh, and email us at ha ha you made a mistake at ltnet.tv if you feel like correcting us um, or when you find the mistake we have made yeah lol noob at ltnet.tv or you're dumb or really anything at ltnet.tv and it should come to, st to, to Tim's uh, inbox and not to spam anymore hey Tim I, I have all of them it seems to have improved <laughs> <laughs> I'm not look oh, I, yeah. I've had problems with uh, Google for about two weeks with weird and wonderful things going on <laughs> they have done some interesting things with this spam they had, lately no never mind that I just my I'm Apple folders broke for a, a week and a half oh. which Google knew about and said we're fixing it <laughs> it's it's now fixed. Yep, yep. This is, by the way, what happens when we tie our uh, our, lives our lives to, to a global monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> 
The question yep. is, is it worse? I'm not, I'm not actually <laughs> I'm sure not it is. I'm not convinced that it's worse. All right. So uh, please check out uh, our other shows on the network, Let's Talk Possibility. Uh, they're on Monday nights yep. if you're watching live or you can just catch them on YouTube or on the site or uh, you can download them because they're a podcast so we've got RSS feeds for these things. And we'll be here same time, same place next week, hopefully with a guest from my gaming to talk awesome. about Gamescom. Cool. So Ooh. that'll be rad. Yeah. So Gamescom was in Germany and I'm sure the guy didn't sleep. So it's, it's bound to be a good show. Very cool. Thanks for watching. <laughs>